You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Welcome back to The Buzz, brought to you by the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I'm Tom Knezic, and this is episode 41 of the chattiest plant <laughs> podcast uh, that you're ever going to find. I'm putting that on a shirt. <laughs> yeah. if, you know, I'm, I'm not even going to reference to what it's about, but I'm sure some of you may already know or figured it <laughs> yeah. out, but I, I just think it's hysterical. That's that's going to be my new t-shirt. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. wear it proudly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but we have a lot lined up for you guys today we um, do we do this is the start of our like plant uh I, we never the really spotlight. came up with a name no no it's, we really didn't yeah it's um but we've mentioned in our last buzz what we want to do is have uh, a podcast that's dedicated to forbs a podcast that's dedicated to grasses one to shrubs one to trees and we're going to be doing that one buzz each over the next i guess two months i guess we better come up with yeah. a name yeah yeah <laughs> before <laughs> yeah, we we don't have a name but yeah. before we 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 do that though I, I think it's important we should probably mention we're really close we're what about a week away or a week and a half away from our one-year anniversary yeah yeah that's right who knew we could do this this long <laughs> yeah that's... happy so i guess in 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 essence this is our anniversary show yeah kind of yeah. but we don't really have anything planned <laughs> no, for our anniversary no, yeah, yeah i'm still kind of riding high off of last week's episode with with samuel thayer that was as far as podcasts go like they're i i love them all i love all mm -hmm. the episodes that one i particularly loved like when we ended with him and hung up the phone and st like hit stop on recording it was I, I i don't even know how to explain it yeah it was uh I think when we we teased it in our Facebook group, that was what I wrote. So I think I have a new favorite podcast uh, episode that came out. But my mine's favorite's always been the next one. Um, yeah. yeah, you're always excited about what's coming up and rel kind of relish in what we've we've talked about before. But that was there was a lot to unpack with that one. But you know, I I always kind of love the ones where we go a little deeper than normal, mm -hmm. which which we did, and I love that Sam was willing to go deep. Um, you know, and it's we we covered a lot, and I learned a lot. You know, yep. I, I I came away feeling that I, I gained something from that one. Um, definitely, you, you definitely. know, especially it, and some of it, some people might consider controversial. And it's, you know, just think there's you could be self sustainable without relying on anyone. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that's a dangerous concept. Uh, I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure probably in some sectors of even our government, there were people that would not want you to know that. So it's it was kind of interesting to really have that conversation with Sam. It really and was. And get his perspective. It's, um, and I think I mentioned in the lead up to that episode is it's something that, especially with coronavirus and COVID, people have been looking to source uh, more of their own their own food. And yeah. um, that's why hunting got more popular through, through coronavirus uh, last year. And um, I'm sure foraging did as well because people were going out into nature. Nature wasn't closed. I guess in some places the parks were closed. <laughs> yeah, they actually but, were in some but places. But if you had a place to go outside, you could go and hike and, and forage and hunt and do all that stuff. And um, it was a time when a lot of these uh, food processing plants were uh, closing down. There was pork shortages and chicken shortages and all kinds of shortage, toilet paper shortages. Yeah, yeah. And totally. you could go – but if you were resourceful, you could go out and source a lot of this stuff yourself and not feel that shortage um, like they portrayed it on the news. Yeah, so. it, it's a, it was just a real eye opener for me on a lot of levels with, with, you know, Sam wasn't just an expert on foraging. He was, he was a historian about it and had a mm -hmm. lot of great knowledge and a lot of different perspectives, which, you know, you really have to wade through that history of what is allowed, what isn't allowed, why, you know, how did we lose our connection with the land? Why is that so? You know, and, and so many rules and regulations and laws and and instances and things like that, trying to wade through that and, and get that connection back and yeah. just kind of uh, reconnect. A lot of people ne have never had that con connection and may not even understand what that connection is. So it's um, hopefully that brings light to, you know, brings this conversation to a lot of other people and people start thinking that way. 
yeah, it's uh, I guess I'll, I'll close up our recap of that and say, if that episode doesn't get you foraging, you probably, you're never going to, you're go never, <laughs> it's, but yeah, I'm excited for this year. We've had a lot of people comment just on the, the picture of ramps and they're excited for ramps. I'm excited um, for ramps too, but yeah, I'm excited for ramps and all other sorts of stuff. So I'm not going to cut down that big pokeweed plant in my backyard this year. I'm <laughs> going to find it and boil it and eat it. So. You know, here's here's a perfect I, – I have a funny pokeweed story, and it was someone that I worked with at a, at a few jobs ago was um, – they were buying a new house and they were walking around and they were looking at the landscape or the real estate agent. And they're like, Oh, we grow this, we grow this. And they're like, I think we grow this. And the real estate agent was like, I hope not. That's pokeweed. <laughs> and they were like, yeah. and they were embarrassed, but it's like, there's value to pokeweed yeah. in the landscape. And it's, it, it's just a different mindset. So it was just funny how embarrassed they were. And today they would, they could probably be really proud of that. Like, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we have, we we have poke weed. <laughs> yes, so. yeah, exactly. So. All right, are you, are you ready to uh, kick in? Yeah, let's get going. All right. It's hot. Would you like to go first, or would you like me to go first? I'll let you go first because this okay. this is a segment that's breaking our rules on Forbes. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. What because, a good start. Because well, it's winter. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's not a whole there. There's not a lot of Forbes right now that are hot. So. Um, I'm I'm gonna change my background just to kind of highlight what what I'm gonna talk about. So uh, my that's hot. I was kind of going through one of the houses, and right now it's I think we've mentioned it before. It's it's hard to pick out something that's hot because we've kind of picked things that have already mm -hmm. showcased winter interest, and we're trying not to repeat ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, but I did notice in <laughs> <laughs> well, that was bound to happen at some point. Some point. So we <laughs> we're a little mishap in in the office. Um, uh, well, good thing it's my turn. Yeah, you go ahead. Turn. All right. So um, Inkberry Holly is my choice because it is uh, one of the few kind of very soft evergreen hollies that we have. Um, it's a facultative wet, uh, but it's commonly found in our pine barrens here in New Jersey and other drier areas. It's a mid-sized shrub and it's very soft touch and it only gets six to eight foot tall. Uh, it's very common in the landscape trade. There's a lot of cultivars like shamrock, and uh, there's a variety densa, and I, th I think Nordic. There's a, there's a few because they're supposed to stay uh, leafy closer to the the base. They do have a tendency. They they're very pr you you can prune them. They 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 take the pruning well, but they have a tendency to lose their leaves at the bottom of the plant. Mm -hmm. um, but we we definitely love the straight Alex Glabra. Uh, it root suckers and can form colonies. It's the only real ilex species to sucker like this. The other other ilex, I have seen American holly sucker, um, but it's the only one that really forms root colonies uh, that way. And it's found all up and down the eastern seaboard uh, to the Gulf, uh, mainly in coastal plain. Uh, you can one of the highlights, and I know some of our listeners will appreciate this. You could dry or roast the leaves and. Uh, it makes tea and it's actually called Appalachian tea. Hmm. There's, there's a name for it. So yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely want to try that uh, this year. Uh, it has a uh, blackberry, hence inkberry, um, and it feeds raccoon deer and 15 species of birds, including Turkey and uh, quail. So that's, that's a great one for it. It provides good cover for rodent, for deer, for birds. Uh, and actually the, the berries persist late. Uh, so it's not really, something that gets eaten earlier and i don't know it, may, it might be a taste preference i don't know hmm. but it's one of those ones that they persist in the spring and it will get eaten more in the spring so cool. i just thought it was a good good choice it's not rigid or sharp like a lot of hollies that you think of like it's it's very soft almost like <laughs> like it's again one of those ones where i walk by and i have to rub my hand yeah. like yep. across it because it just has a very soft flowing feel like kind of like you're like in someone's hair mm -hmm. <laughs> you know so it's um, if you don't know that plant, familiarize yourself with that plant. It's it's a great one. You can use it for hedging, uh, or or just as a specimen. It's a great yeah. plant. Yeah, and I know you might even said this when I was fixing our our, <laughs> our light light drop behind me, but um, one of the things I guess a, a negative thing about it is at least with straight species they can be really leggy. Yeah. When they're young. Yes. But uh. But once they get big and they really fill out, oh, they're awesome. 
So. Oh, I put the wrong background back up. There we go. That's better. <laughs> so, so no, it, and and they take pruning really well, but they do mm -hmm. the new growth tends to shoot like really leggy growth. Yep. So it you, you can prune it really heavy actually, mm -hmm. and it it takes well to that. So. Yeah. So I, I was already putting up my vote for Fran. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was an accident. So um, mine was uh, red twig dogwood or red osier dogwood, or there's a ton of different names for it. Yeah. Cornus sericea. Yes, is uh, is the botanical name for it. And, it's and I don't know. You know, here's the thing. I'm not really sure if Cornus stolonifera and Cornus sericea are really two different plants uh, yeah i'm not sure either because i know on when i looked on bone app for the the nativity map it doesn't even list uh sericea and, and it's yeah i'm not really sure like obviously stolonifera because it's stolonifers and and, mm -hmm. and shoots and suckers but um yeah i don't really know I, i'm not sure but uh it's a cool plant and why i chose it right now is like most of the country we have a lot of snow cover here um and more on the way and that's one thing with this time of year it gets those red red twigs or red shoots yeah. and it really stands out along uh, with a white backdrop so it's more um i used it for aesthetic reasons yeah. i didn't look up all the other <laughs> uses for it i didn't do my homework this week but no but it's great and that's one as the stems get older they tend to get more green mm -hmm. um so again you can you can take that really far back you can cut it like back to a foot yeah uh and when it shoots up you'll get that red growth again it does sucker there again, this is another one where there's a ton of cultivars and varieties out there, but uh, there's nothing wrong with you know because they say oh it's redder you know the stems yeah, get more yeah. red that there's nothing wrong with the straight species on that you can go yeah. you can go with that so I think those are both good choices yeah it's getting yeah. harder and good thing that spring is right around the corner and we're gonna <laughs> have a lot more to choose from in just a month or two yeah because it's it's getting to the point where like it's I'm not just coming across something now like I'm actually looking yeah to, for something yeah. that that is showing some really good winter interest mm -hmm. right now yeah. so it's yeah i'm happy by the time we do the next buzz we should be in march early march yeah although yeah. with the forecast we'll probably still be <laughs> still be covered with snow yeah. so all right i think that that wraps it up you got anything oh, yeah. else no that's it all right wow we're moving along quick today well we got a lot to cover later on we yeah, tease the whole Ford part, but that's yeah, at the end. That's that so, is at the very end. We gotta, so we gotta get there. We gotta stop being so chatty. All right. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right. So um I didn't, you know, I wrote what the total was down a couple days ago, and I think it hasn't changed. I don't think it has. Uh, I don't think I it has looked. changed. But the uh the the winner of uh the last uh, this or that. It was me, ten to six. It was actually we got a lot of votes, and oh, yeah. it, it that's actually pretty close. Yeah, like I, I think, and Definitely. it was because I started off with a lot of votes, and then you started creeping up. I was mm -hmm. like, oh no, I can't, I can't get cocky. I gotta let it, yeah. <laughs> let it go. So, um, we, I, I appreciate everyone taking the time to read the articles, listen to the buzz, and and vote on that. The more, the merrier. We don't know if you guys <laughs> were actually there yeah. on the last, but. Or the last yeah, podcast, we didn't have heat on which the last, Sam, yeah, last we had no heat. They're installing the heater today. More than likely, you can't hear it, but they're installing it right above us, <laughs> like on the yeah. on the, the yeah in the cross or not cross space, but the, the um, attic, attic area, area above, above us. So our, our office here, um, and they're hammering away. They're hammering <laughs> away. So it's I don't know if you hear it, but we hear it, and it's just we knew it was eventually going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I think I'm going to go first. Since I get to choose, right. I'm I'm up what overall the the four, total, to three. four to three, so it's still pretty close. Mm -hmm. We're getting more votes, and the votes are getting closer. Mm -hmm. So, um, just remember, there can be only one. All right. So my article uh, this week is called "Researchers Find Non-Native Species in Ho Oahu." play greater role in seed dispersal networks uh and the article is by the university of wyoming and it was published in uh phys.org phys mm -hmm. so um i i felt it was a uh a very interesting article and you were actually kind of familiar tom that you knew mm -hmm. that i they were saying oahu at this point really isn't a native ecosystem anymore mm -hmm. it's been overrun by by non-natives, especially like a lot of Hawaii is like that, but especially Oahu. Um, and the researchers uh, 
at University of Wyoming headed a study that shows that non-native birds in Oahu have taken over the role of seed dispersal network on the island with most of the seeds coming from non-native plants, which which kind of makes sense um, because we, we talked about provenance and straight species and evolution with, with birds and animals evolving with the plants. So the birds that evolved with these plants, which the native species are mm -hmm. bigger seeds, the non-native birds can't eat the, the seeds are too big for them. Yeah. And so they're just not touching them. They're only dealing with the exotic, the exotic birds are dealing with the exotic plants they know. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's totally taking over and, and they're losing their, their native ecosystem and it's becoming a non-native ecosystem. So um, they're saying it's one of the first studies showing that non-native species can take over the most important roles in seed dispersal networks, uh, meaning Oahu's ecosystems have been so affected by species extinction and invasions that most of the seeds dispersed on the island belong to non-native plants and most of them are uh, dispersed by non-native birds. Um, it forms what's called an ecological meltdown which is a process occurring when non-native uh, mutualistic partners benefit each other and put the system into a vortex of continuous modification. So before Hawaii became the extinct, extinction and species invasion capital of the world, which I didn't know that, mm -hmm. um, its ecological communities were much more diverse. Experts estimate, uh, estimate that in the last 700 years, 77 species and subspecies of birds in the Hawaiian archipelago have gone extinct, accounting for 15% of bird extinction in the world. So that's, that's a direct effect with the ecosystem change and allowing invasives or non-natives to take over or non-native mm -hmm. species. Um, non-native birds are uh, a double-edged sword for the ecosystem because they are the only dispersers of native plants at the present. Most of the seeds dispersed on Oahu belong to non-natives. Uh, and that's a quote, I can't pronounce her name. Uh, Vizentin Bugoni. Uh, many native plant species have large seeds resulting from co-evolution with large birds. Such birds are now extinct and the seeds cannot be swallowed. So they're not being dispersed. So small build uh, passerines now uh, are, that's that's, yeah. that's what you got. So it's that whole ecosystem's changing. Now, is it an ecosystem? Yes, but it's less diverse. It's not mm -hmm. operating the same. So if it's less diverse, you know, it's not saying whether or not it has the same functions or if it's, obviously it's not, contributing to the food web the same way if 70, 77 mm -hmm. birds have gone extinct. So um, it's interesting that I think I kind of feel like, <laughs> like we're getting to see into the future. This is what we're scared of and what we're talking about in New Jersey and trying to prevent. And you could see somewhere else that is happening. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just don't know. They don't really, it's great that the research has been done to prove that. I would love to know how the ecosystem functions differently yeah. now. And if it's, functional or not as functional mm -hmm. i guess that would be the next it, are they losing pollination services yes um because of this mm -hmm. uh, so the only reason i actually knew this was going on was um was through monarchs in the rough when uh there was a golf course that signed up for monarchs in the rough got sent to us that we had to source mm -hmm. seed for them and we were having a heck of a time how do you find the hawaii source of milkweed yeah uh and through that program again we were sending milkweed um local ecotype milkweed to golf courses all over the country uh all over north america mexico and canada too um and when i started looking it up that's when well there's no native milkweed to hawaii yeah and then that's where it was like, well there's really nothing or very little that's native there anyway it's just been overrun with other plants because of all the extinctions and and um, and all that. So that's the only reason I had any background in, in your article. Yeah. But yeah, it's, uh, it kind of shows what can happen. And I'd be interested to see what are the ecosystem services that they've lost and is it balanced out now that you have a, uh, a non-native ecosystem there, or is it, is, are they really or missing it, something? So. You, you know, and that's, I guess that's the real ethical conundrum there. It's mm -hmm. all right. If you replace one ecosystem with a different ecosystem and they perform the same functions, that really changes how you approach it. Like, is that, mm -hmm. is that, you know, survival of the fittest that this, mm -hmm. these plants and these animals and birds took over for these animals and yeah. birds, 
or are we creating that? And yeah. what's the value of saving those, mm-hmm. those things? You know, obviously you don't want anything to go to extinct. You, they all had a place functioning in certain areas. Mm-hmm. And if, if you, if you surpass or, or supplant all these interesting, unique ecosystems with one generic ecosystem, what are you losing overall? Yeah. There has to be a loss. That and then, would, yeah, like going even further, it's what do you restore it back to? And is it, yeah. is it possible to restore back? I'm like a kind of uh, far-fetched parallel is the New Jersey Meadowlands where yeah. it historically wasn't a salt marsh, but because of the dikes and everything that were put yeah. up, it became a, a salt marsh that was full of invasives and restored it to a salt marsh that uh, probably wasn't wasn't really there. No, because it was. I think it was proven it was Atlantic white cedar. It was yeah. a freshwater. Well, you can't go back to that. Yeah, but it's, yeah, you can't go back to it. So they so. made it a more function, more functioning salt marsh mm-hmm. that provides more to the ecosystem. It it mm-hmm. has it it contributes more to the food web yeah. than the meadowlands were typically uh, Phragmites. Like after. Mm-hmm. You, you lose all these Atlantic white cedars and then you just have open space. So what comes in, yeah. you know, Phragmites, it was like the perfect, it was not high salinity. They were able to, it was perfect conditions and it could outcompete everything mm-hmm. else. So you just had a monoculture. Uh, it doesn't have the same, I think we, we said before, I think um, Phragmites only host three Lepidoptera yeah. compared to, yep. you know, native Spartinas and things like the smooth cord grass, mm-hmm. uh, salt marsh hay, things like that. So it's, you know, yeah. it, it's I without the studies, I would tend to believe that what is there now is better than the Phragmites, even though yeah, yeah. the exotic I'm sure Phragmites Bill Young can tell us. Or, yeah. I, and we have a lot of friends who could they're probably listening that. and they're gonna call us up <laughs> this comes out and straighten us no, out. No, but you know, so, and there are people that argue that hey, that Phragmites they're providing mm-hmm. uh cover and it's providing uh preventing soil erosion and it's forming a function but it's not performing as good of a function as the native species yeah. so it's just you, you need the next step in the scientific study saying mm-hmm. all right even though you still have a functioning ecosystem which ecosystem is performing more yeah. functions yeah. not the best functions more functions mm-hmm. if it's performing 10 functions at an eight i would rather have that than someone that's something that's performing three functions at a 10 yeah yeah. So, and I guess that's the next step. So it's, I, I think we're getting there. We just, and maybe the studies are already there. I just feel like yeah, we I'm need sure to get they're there doing, faster. Yeah. They're doing some of that research. Yeah. So All right. So that's mine. Yeah. Mine was, uh, was an article from the New York Times, actually an opinion piece. Um, and it was drawing some parallels to, actually, I should probably pull up the title. It was, um, um, I, don't, I, I don't, I have it on my <laughs> other computer. <laughs> you know, but, I, I, let me see if I can yeah. click, click it and get it to come up. Well, um, with how slow yeah. my computer's been running, it'll probably take for you'll be done by the time I get the. Uh, it basically was saying um, there's a lot of parallels between uh, COVID 19 and our response, and how, well, basically, how diseases aren't just killing us, they're killing our trees and forests as well. Okay. So the, the name of the article, it's opinion piece, it's called Invasive Insects and Diseases Are Killing Our Forests. There you go. Yeah, I was close. Yeah, that's... But, <laughs> but basically, it's uh, it was looking at how how we've responded in the past to things like emerald ash borer, um, spotted lanternfly, more recently, different funguses and diseases that are brought over from uh, foreign sources. Yeah. Um, similar to COVID nineteen and how it originated in a foreign source and it was brought here, uh, and our response to that and, um really was saying that we're, I don't want to say negligent, but we haven't been responding fast enough or at all to some of these, these uh, insect and funguses and, and other invaders that are killing our forests as we did COVID-19 because it's not on the surface. It's not affecting us as people. Like COVID-19 is very visibly affecting how we live our day-to-day life. It's killing people directly. Um, But Emerald ash borer killed millions, probably tens of millions of ash trees across yeah. the country. Spotted lanternfly is is decimating like millions of, of dollars of crops every year. And I, I think and, part of that's because it's unknown because these yeah. insects in their in their native um <laughs> how is that even 
coming through on we're, my phone. This is, we're having a lot of I got I, I just got a spam today. call and that's the ringtone <laughs> from Charlie the Unicorn. There you go. That's my mentality. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my mentality level. Yeah. Um these insects in their in their natural state are kept in check because they have their natural predators and, mm -hmm. and food source. So no one really knows the repercussions when they come here, how fast or how quickly. And sometimes it's not right away. They may lay low and then boom, explode. Yeah. So it's, yep. but I know, I remember even when, when spotted lantern fly came, I think it was PA state extension agents went to Korea mm -hmm. to, to find out, you know, how to, how they deal with the problem. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Oh, we don't, we don't <laughs> like, we don't have much of a solution either. We don't know. Yeah. So it was kind of like yep. coming up with a solution on the fly. Yeah. And, um, well, like spotted land fly in particular, that came over. It was an egg mass that was on a rock that came from, uh, I think Doug Talmy said it was from China, yeah. but somewhere in, in Asia uh, and was used in the United States. The eggs hatched. And then you had a population, that, a growing population of spotted land fly that's now wreaking havoc across the mid Atlantic. Yeah. Um, emerald ash borer was, came uh, in wood products and originated out of Detroit. And then it spread from there and then became a, a big time problem. Yeah. And um, so we have some steps to try and stop this stuff. But uh, this is where I didn't like the article was. The, well, it is opinion. Too, the author so didn't, didn't really. I, I hate articles that don't offer um, a solution. And this one. Uh, they tried to offer a half-hearted solution, but it was a, a solution they even wrote how it would, wouldn't really work. Um, and that was, they want, said, well, why don't we just ban the, the um, shipment of incoming foreign trees and, and shrubs and plants? Well, that's not going to happen anytime soon, at least. So. You know, I, I could see that, that maybe someday we get to that point mm -hmm. where people realize the the detriments of bringing these exotics over and and how it affects our ecosystems and how valuable our native plants are but i i think we're a long way yeah away from yeah the, the nursery business is a billions of dollar year business the overall taste of landscapes across the like commercial and residential is non-native stuff uh, they, it's growing in the native sector but what is it a, a few percent if if, if if everyone knew the amount of money made off of plant patents yeah, that's yeah. a lucrative business. There's there's businesses that just just do hybridize that. Yeah. and find cultivars, and and survive just off the patents. They don't even grow the plants. They just uh, hybridize the plants and and sell those patents. And you know, you think of things like the amount of money that's made off of honey uh, domestically mm -hmm. and and plant patents. That's that's going to be a tough fight. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know, because mm -hmm. you're you're changing a lot of things and a lot of that's a lot of yeah. their that's their livelihood. But but there are inspections that happen already. Uh, obviously, stuff still slips through. They're saying that I think they found like 800 live insects on incoming shipments last year. Well, that's, think about all the, the sea trailers that are coming over yeah. every year. Sea boxes are coming over on every day. And that's how much they, they found. There's um, Even though there's inspections, you, even if you got more strict with the inspections, there's only so much you can do with human eyes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it's an interesting parallel that the drawing between our response to COVID-19 versus this, because this is the loss of our, yeah. our native habitats um, is only accelerated by invasive species. And it's, uh, it's going to have long lasting effects on our health mm -hmm. as well. It's just not in our face, killing people every day right now no and it's mm -hmm. you have to keep that diversity to to defend against some of these attacks mm -hmm. you know we talk about it all the time with provenance you you want um you want everything spread from seed so you get that genetic diversity so mm -hmm. if uh and you don't want a monoculture because if if a disease were to come through you don't want it to wipe the whole thing out like yeah. it will wipe mm -hmm. some some will be lost some will not be and and this you know the stronger you know, multiply and move on, and it just kind of adapts. You know, it, they they learn to coexist, they learn to adapt, and even mm -hmm. though it may go down, it can come back. And you kind of need that. So yeah. it, the more you take away from these things or respond slowly, the harder it is to recover. Yeah. Yep. So and and I love that that's being talked about in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, that's yeah. important. It's that's a great exposure. It was a, yeah. It was a good start to a conversation that needs to happen. It's um. 
I can't, I, there was a quote that I was thinking of. I can't remember it now, but uh, or it's um, if you had a yes or no question and if you don't ask, it's always going to be a no. Yeah. And that's, this is kind of asking people to listen to this, listen yeah. to this conversation and talk about natives. And yeah, maybe people are still going to say, ah, no, I'm not, I don't care about it, but there's going to be a handful that read it and say yeah. yes. Yeah. So it's a good thing that it's out there. It's in such a widespread paper like the New York times, mm -hmm. because people are going to come across it and, and it's going to get that conversation flowing. I mm -hmm. hope to see more and more of that. I do too. Over, over the years. There's actually a lot of good choices for articles this week. Yeah, it was. And I think both of us have really yeah. good ones and, and it should be an interesting vote yeah. to see, oh, yeah. you know, for me, if I had to pick between those two, I don't know which one I'm picking because yeah. they're both really good articles. Yeah. They both have great impact. Yeah. So, but in the end, I don't get to choose. You don't get to choose. It's up to our Facebook group listeners. If you mm -hmm. belong to the group, you can only vote if you uh, join our group, which just keeps growing and growing. Oh, yeah. Um, but just remember, in the end. And of course, the choice is yours. So we got questions. Yes. With a yeah, twist. we got a lot of questions. We're, we're doing a little bit. We, we got more than one question, which is interesting. So um, I want to ask you a bunch of questions. I want to have them answered immediately. It's a simple question. Um, no, I didn't hear you. What was your question? So um, I do want to, before we play the first question, I kind of want to follow up on the last buzz with Matt because he did, I, I was listening through and there was one question he asked that we, we kind of answered, but not really. He wanted to know if there was an a seed bank after he removed the Phragmites, how mm -hmm. you would activate it. And we never really touched on that. We just said if, if the seed bank's there. Um, you got to remember, it, if any of you have seen our whiteboard ecology with uh, Bill Young on successional forests, it's kind mm -hmm. of like that. They, they need to activate that, that seed bank. They need sun and space. So mm -hmm. by removing something, you're getting the sunlight. They're getting the space. And if it's there, it may take a little bit of time, but it, it should activate. It should come up. So um, – you just once you remove that Phragmites, you want to you know minimize your footprint. That's how I was saying you may want to plant some plants to cover that that bare ground and mm -hmm. get something in, but leaving enough space that if there is existing seed that it can come up. So I just kind of felt like we hadn't I yeah. didn't address that. Yeah, you're right. There was a lot in his question that to to address, and we just we got so excited. Yeah. yeah, we got so excited. So, but um. We did get a a, a calling question from an old friend, mm -hmm. and uh, let's let's just play her message. Hold on one sec. Hi, Fran and Tom. This is Carolyn from New Jersey, and I have a question for you. So, I just finished reading "Braiding Sweet Grass" by Robin Wall uh, Kimmerer, and it was a really great book. And I really love the part where she was talking about goldenrods and asters um, and how those colors, the purples and the yellows complement each other um, and really, you know, draws the eye in not just of people, but also of pollinating insects. And I wanted to know if you had any other combination of recommendations of plants that I or anybody else could plant together that would help uh, draw in pollinators, but specifically going with complementary plants so a grouping of different species that i that i could put together that would be really powerful thanks so much so i thought that was a fantastic question mm -hmm. and, th and that kind of leads into um our forbes uh the section on yeah. this so oh, yeah. i i didn't feel as comfortable you know like anything else when i when i don't know the answer i know where to go to get the answer mm -hmm. um and i'm not confident with my design standpoint and i'm colorblind so i'm not confident to do that mm -hmm. um i don't know how well you feel about it yeah i'm yourself. not a, i'm not a plant designer either and i have a couple couple ideas but i'm gonna let our our expert we brought in yeah. answer first so like we said when we don't know when we don't have a great answer we know where to get the answer so we decided to phone a friend uh on this one and we brought back uh a former guest in Kelly Gill from the Cersei Society to answer uh, Carolyn's question. So here we go. Hi, Fran and Tom. This is Kelly Gill calling from Collingswood, New Jersey. And I'm calling in reference to the message that Carolyn from New Jersey left about color combinations for our native plants and meadows. 
Um, she mentioned goldenrods and asters, and I completely agree. Um, that's, that's such a great color combination. In fact, complementary colors. Um, but we have so many ways to plan for those types of aesthetic appeals um, and still provide value to our pollinators and other wildlife. So in early spring, I really love the combination of penstemons with the white or pink bell-shaped flowers, so penstemon hirsutus and digitalis, with our native spiderwort, which also have a very whimsical um, grass-like foliage that's dark green, which makes those purples and whites pop in the landscape. In summer through fall, we have lots of things we can dedicate um, in our meadow planning. So we've had some people that have done memorial meadows planting red, white, and blue flowers or red, red white, and purple. Um, I personally love purples and pinks of summer, so things like coneflowers and monarda, um, especially with our grasses like big blue stem, those dark green tall grasses really complement those flower colors and again make them pop um, in the landscape. So I'd like to mention to not forget those grasses and sedges, you know, um, things in wetland areas like um, <clears throat> cardinal flower and our sedges that are dark green or bluish green really complement each other in color. And if you're looking for more information on selecting species that are great for pollinators and wildlife, that fit the conditions of your landscape um, or the site you're working on, and you want to have some sort of theme, whether it be a memorial garden or just your favorite colors, um, let me know. You could contact me at kelly at xerces.org. Uh, that's my email address, and I'd be happy to help you select plants. And I'm sure Tom and Fran have a lot of great suggestions as well. Carolyn, thank you for this wonderful question. I think it's important to change the way people perceive our landscape and what's beautiful. And I also love the book Braiding Sweetgrass. I hope you have a great day. Bye. I don't have any suggestions, <laughs> but I think Kelly had some incredible suggestions. Even just hearing them, I was like, wow, that those are great ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just want to mention, I need to read Breeding Sweetgrass. That just is a book that just keeps coming up in our Facebook yeah. group and our calls, and I haven't done it yet. And so, I'll um, even add that we uh, we actually got a lot of requests for that in the Facebook group yeah. right after we had Sam Thayer on. Yeah. And um, so I said, well, why don't I just shoot her an email? And I haven't got a response yet. Okay. But I did send an email, invite her to come on, and hopefully we get Robin Wall Kimmerer on. That would be wonderful. Soon. And I, so, I, I am going out there saying i will start reading that book yeah. soon in the yeah. next in the next week i'll start there we go how's that for yeah. a commitment so I'll yeah so that commitment. that's hopefully something that we is is going to happen fairly quickly um do you have any have on. do you have any suggestions i do yeah and this is mostly um just from i shouldn't even say experience but just from uh like i guess happy accidents <laughs> okay. way to put it All right. in my own garden uh one of the combinations i really like this past year um, was the combination of uh, Monarda didyma mm -hmm. and um, uh, what, Cardinal flower, oh. but combined with, uh, it was Rebecca triloba. And now that's actually, I learned from an actual uh, landscape architect that putting red and yellow together is not a, a, um, not something that they really like in the American landscape. They don't like wow. putting red and yellow together. I guess it's popular in Asia, specifically okay. China. Um, I guess that's a Chinese flag oh, okay. is yes. one of the reasons yeah. why. But in America, that's not a combination that you find that often. And a lot of people don't like it because it, they're two very strong colors. Yeah. But, um, but you know, and, and I really loved it. Minarda it was... Didima is bee balm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you said lobelia, but it's cardinal flower. Cardinal I don't flower, remember yeah. Rudbecki Triloba uh, what is, is the common um, name for that. Oh, now I'm forgetting. I, I don't remember. It looks, it's very similar to a Black Eyed Susan. It's, yeah, but it's um, like a smaller petal. Smaller petal, uh, just a smaller flower head. And yeah. mine in particular got really full of flowers. The only complaint I had with that combination of plants was the Rudbeckia trilobo got a little bit tall. Yeah. I have another section in my garden that is um, 
another happy accident, I guess, where it's uh, Rebecca Fulgida, which stays shorter. And I think that would really be a cool combo with the the uh, the Cardinal Flower shoots come up. This is this is very Claudia West esque. And here. both at the you so know Cardinal the and everything. Cardinal Flower and Rebecca Fulgida, which is which is orange cone flower, mm -hmm. um, both have basal foliage, uh, really nice basal foliage. Yeah. So that combination gives you like a nice ground cover uh, in the early spring before mm -hmm. they they um, push up the flower shoots. And it's the most of the height are the flowers on both of those species. So it's yeah. that's a good mix. The one thing I like about uh, Minarda didyma to me it smells like Fruit Loops. Really? <laughs> yeah, I kind of. I think get most that. people say mint, but yeah. Oh, to me, I get like loops. a Fruit yeah. Loop like scent from it. I don't yeah. know. I don't know why that is, but so some of the other combinations I really like was we have a wild area in our nursery in up in upstate New York, and um, this September I actually put a picture of this on our our uh, Instagram page, um, but there was a combination of goldenrods with New York ironweed. And the New York Island is like six or seven feet tall, yeah. but the golden rods were like almost as tall. And it was really, that was a cool combo. And then you had some, uh, some cardinal flower in front of the hat that looked really cool. Oh, very nice. Um, and even some of the, in that picture, you'll see it. Some of the uh, golden rods actually gone to seed already. It's, okay. it's a lot colder climate up yeah. there than we are, we are in New Jersey. So, and in September, that wasn't that odd, but um, that red and white, or grayish white of the seed heads with the cardinal flower look really cool as well. Uh, and then from our demo garden at our other farm here, uh, just the combination of uh, New York aster and then um, white wood aster oh, was a really nice, yeah. good, com really cool combination. Just white and purple together. That looked really nice for the yeah. fall. So And and everything we're, we're mentioning has great pollinator yeah. benefits as mm -hmm. well. So yeah. Um you can imagine the the sea of pollinators that would enjoy that yeah i'm looking forward i don't know if this is going to be a good combination or not but i'm looking forward to um just in in my garden is uh i have pensman digitalis um uh, baptisia australis which is oh, wild blue indigo yeah. and then um coreopsis lanceolata in oh, one spot nice... but there's i only planted them a year ago so they're a little bit immature they're not up the full size yet but i'm look i think that i thought that would be a cool combo to give it a little bit of brightness the the coreops is in the front then the penstem and uh is just behind that and the baptizia is kind of behind it so i think it's going to work well but i'll take if, pictures of this year if, and hopefully it'll be big if, enough if anyone is planting or growing from seed the baptizia be patient because it yes. takes oh, a yeah. few years before you start getting blooms on that mm -hmm. so don't expect you know blooms right away i think it takes two to three years yeah before yeah you start I, so seeing i was blooms. working with yeah. an overwintered plant when i planted in yeah. last or excuse me two springs ago so this was actually his third year and i had okay. a couple a couple flowers but not like when they're full full size so. yeah yeah so just be patient with that one yeah. so but those are some great su yeah. suggestions yeah. carolyn and and of course for those of you who may not have recognized her voice, Carolyn is a former guest also from yep. the, the mm -hmm. Caroline Clauba from the Sourland Conservancy. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we appreciate you calling in and asking questions. Kelly, thank you so much for, for answering, uh, being our phone a friend mm -hmm. on that one. There is one more phone call. Oh, from our friend Saul. <laughs> Saul, it's been a, it's I'm been glad a, actually. It's, we haven't heard from him it, in a while. It's been a few. So. I, I actually kind of miss. Uh, I, I thought we got a little too negative the last time and he wasn't going to call back. No, oh, but he called back. He called back. Good. You ready? Good. All right. Hello, you pine nut. It's me, your friend Saul, calling uh, calling you from New Jersey. And I'm I'm doing, I'm okay, I guess. I'm, I'm making myself a cup of the winterberry tea. Uh, from the Gaultheria, the procumbens, um, because I have, I woke up in the middle of the night and there was some type of a badger or perhaps a wolverine in my garden. So I ran outside quick to shoo it away and I threw a boot at it and I, I hurt my elbow and it, it is very painful for me. Anyway, I, I need to make an amendment and I want to apologize, Pam, to your, your colleague there. Tom, who I believe I might have called John or Jim, or perhaps little Timmy, I forget. Anyway, I know he is Tom. Tom it is. And I will remember him always uh, because he invented that Tom Tom Go, the, the navigation system. Uh, so I'm calling uh, for the basis of good karma. And 
much like a common deer, which was a lot of people didn't know this pimp. It was a Volkswagen, but nobody knew. So we all went out and bought Peugeots instead. Uh, but, but okay. All right. My, my droopy coneflower friend, I need some advice, please. You recall we spoke a bit on the topic of the natives uh, for my, my garden of loneliness, which is doing quite well. But I planted the Forbes, you know it, the Forbes. And I was looking at the garden just now, and I don't see the tops of the dawn things. And I, I was curious. Are they what they are called doorknob plants? You know a doorknob plant that goes into hiding, like under covers uh, during the winter, dead as a doorknob, I believe is where the, the terminology comes from. But then, surprise, in the spring they come back. I believe it is called a state of doorknob or something. I, I forget. Because I looked up the Forbes, uh, Pam, and, and Tom, Tom, I remember, and I saw some old guy, Forbes, and he was wearing a leather outfit, all shiny, and he was with Elizabeth Taylor, and it was all fancy, and he was riding a scooter. And I don't think that's the same thing, because I have a scooter, but I had it before I bought the Forbes. So I am very, very confused from this, and I would like a discussion, please, fellas, on the Forbes. Now, also, Pam, I liked when you held up the card for the random uh, topic, and it made me think of, of my old friend Brian Eno with the oblique strategies, and I think that is very wise of you. And also, if you have um, any, like, hats or warm winter gloves uh, with the name, the pine nuts on it, I could really use it because it's a bit chilly. Okay, fellas, my name is Saul. Th thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll start off and say that by nickname, just by going to high school, yeah. um, at the time that the TomTom -Tom GPS came out, <laughs> I think every Tom became TomTom. -Tom. <laughs> so that, that's not the, that's not the worst thing in the world. You are now TomTom. Tom. At, at least, at least he's saying your name. I'm still Pam. Yes, so yeah. I'm still relegated, which is to... actually caught on in the the Facebook group too. A lot I, of people are calling you Pam, which I, is nice. Yeah, I, I have noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> that I am being referred to as Pam. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. I, I did I did kind of feel that Saul's references are definitely getting more obscure. Oh, yeah. He's really I think he's trying to stump us. I, I am, it's... but we're going to definitely like <laughs> like root them out and and kind of set the record straight. So he mentioned Galtheria procrumbens, which is wintergreen, not winterberry. You and something want... you can you consume. Yeah, you can consume. So... It is a native. So um and it's that's wintergreen that's mm -hmm. you know uh tea ber or tea berry it's also called like tea berry gum if you're old enough to remember that is called theory of procumbens um so it's not winterberry we've already established on a previous buzz that 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 is not uh consumable that is not um good to eat for humans for for wildlife yes for humans no so it is a uh, wintergreen um do we have badgers or wolverines in New Jersey? I don't believe so. I'm actually googling it right now, and uh, that would be a good question for Emil. Yeah, Emil would know. Emil would know that. Emil DeVito would know that. But I do love that that Saul was not scared to shoo them out of his garden of loneliness. That he and he... give himself another injury. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no pun intended. Um, a a Carmen Gia, for those of you that don't know, if you've ever seen the movie Pretty in Pink. Uh, Molly Ringwald drove a Carmen Ghia, Volkswagen Carmen Ghia in that. So that's that's how I learned what a Carmen Ghia was when I was in. I learned what a Carmen Ghia was right now. I am today years you, old <laughs> when I learned what a Carmen Ghia yeah. was. One of these days, I'll share the story on here. Like I'll sidetrack that John Hughes, who who uh, wrote Pretty in Pink. I don't know if he directed that one, but the writer of so many movies was one of my customers. Really? Uh, wow. Yeah, and and I I spoke to him quite frequently, and we would email back and forth. Hmm. So I'll, I'll share that story at some point. Um, did I share it? I, I don't not, think so. I don't no. think. Okay. Um, so I think it's not doorknob species <laughs> that <laughs> Saul was yeah. referring to. Dormant. These are plants that go dormant, so um, they die back like a perennial forb mm -hmm. would would die back to to the ground so it's more a state of dormancy not doorknob um from forbes the old man forbes was malcolm forbes not <laughs> not the plant Forbes. so um you know there are pictures of him on the internet with elizabeth taylor and motorcycles so i'd like to see if saul actually had a motorcycle or a scooter 
what kind I of i think scooter? it was a sidecar guy oh ooh. he's not the guy who rode the motorcycle <laughs> he, he rode on the side <laughs> you know what that's such a great visual <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i love that um I would like to know, though, if Saul was really friends with Brian Eno, of course, of Roxy Music fame, producer, uh, extraordinaire, collaborator with David Bowie. So Oblique Strategies were a set of cards that Brian Eno uh, kind of developed with um, – oh, what's his name? Artist uh, Peter Schmidt, and they, cr- they used them. It was a set of cards they made with ideas. They used it to spark creativity. Uh, they would use it in the studio or if they were writing a song just to kind of – like if they were at a crossroad, they would pull out mm-hmm. these cards. And that's basically what these pod deck cards are that we use, which we'll use another one today. Yeah. But it just kind of sp- sparks creativity. It gets you thinking outside of the box. And I really have enjoyed oh, yeah. where yeah, these definitely. go. It's cool. Um, and I guess the last thing for Saul, before we go into Forbes, which is the main reason why mm-hmm. I called, you wanted to know more. Do we have any pine nuts gear for, for Saul? I think we're out of hats and scarves now. We're, we're, scarves, at, we're actually yeah. out of hats and scarves, but I'm sure we have mugs. Mm-hmm. We can yeah, send him we'll a have, mug we'll and maybe some seed. For giving us so much content. Yeah. The last few <laughs> He's really been a wealth of content. So, and we want Saul to keep calling. Yeah, also. Definitely. So definitely. hopefully, hopefully that will happen. But, that both of these calls kind of led into where we were going with this mm-hmm. one. We wanted to start with Forbes because we're not that far around the corner uh, from spring and, and having these things starting to show a sign of life. Actually, we've started seeding in our greenhouses in February. Mm-hmm. A lot of these herbaceous species so that we have them ready for sale in two-inch plugs uh, come come April and May. Um, so we really wanted to focus on that with yeah. this episode and just kind of talk about what is a Forb and what are the benefits of Forbes mm-hmm. or, or some of the characteristics. So uh, I thought, what do you think? Definition? Just yeah. The yeah so when you, when you look up the definition of a Forb, uh, it's an herbaceous flowering plant other than a grass, which is a graminoid. So, mm-hmm. um, and it can be an annual, a biennial or a perennial, and it can't become woody. It doesn't, mm-hmm. it doesn't form woody stems. So um, that is by definition a Forb. Yeah. Yeah. And, these tend to be like the heavy hitters um, when it comes to pollinators, when it comes to, at least I, I shouldn't say, uh, they probably aren't necessarily the best species for them, but they're the most obvious species for them. This is yeah. what people go for when they want to bring pollinators in their garden or bring birds or really all kinds of wildlife. They need these, uh, need forbs yeah. and, and I- wildflowers to to survive yeah and i you know i know people like doug tallamy are, are touting like a white oak is mm-hmm. is most important and and there will be more on that when we get yeah to, yep. to woody's but you know I, the forbes promo- provide throughout a large portion of the year from from uh mid spring till late fall mm-hmm. so much uh stagger so much bloom time and and flower type and and there's you know, for for migrating pollinators, uh, it it provides so much along the way to help them uh, gain enough sustenance to to, to keep moving mm-hmm. along their path. So, um, very important for pollinators. Very important for wildlife. Um, you know, like uh, I I saw this one. I was doing some research. Like a quail actually needs forbs, graminoids, and woodies to survive. Mm-hmm. It can't use just one. So, when you're in woods and all you have are, are trees and the understory is gone and there's there's very little grass or you know that's that's when you start losing yeah. habitat so oh, yeah. it's important it's not the most important you need all of these but and it's, it's very important. a lot of speed a lot of species not your uh, outside of insects but a lot of species of birds and mammals and snakes all that kind of stuff need a diversity of habitat they like we're talking about forbs today but they need all of those things shrubs yeah. included to to survive in their ecosystem, not just for, for cover, but a lot of times for food, whether they're eating the plant itself or in quail's case where they're eating some plant seeds, but yeah. it's actually more while, why these plants are important to them is they bring in insects and then they can eat the insects and the insects yeah. as Doug tell me to especially caterpillars, high in protein, really important in the, the developmental stages of these birds, especially because yeah. they can't eat, so they can't digest the seeds yet in a lot of cases. So that's why they're so important. Um, Doug Tallamy focuses a lot on on caterpillars and lepidoptera species, yeah. but uh, but there's a lot of species that are a little eye off this. Whether it's like quail, like you mentioned, yeah. uh, rabbits, deer, 
turkeys, all kinds of stuff oh, wow. relies um, heavily on Forbes. Uh, with deer in particular, that's their their primary browse uh, during the summer. Um, they don't eat a lot of grasses. They'll use them for cover, but they really need Forbes, and they can use Forbes for cover and uh, and for food. Yeah. So, and a lot of animals are like that. But well, when you, even if you think of what Sam Thayer says about you know leafy greens, yeah, you know yep. even for us, you know sustenance wise, some yeah. of those aren't. Oh yeah. Bad. So some of the the genera, I guess, that are really good when it comes to mm-hmm. Forbes are are goldenrods. A really good one. There's, I don't even know, a hundred species of golden rods across America. Oh, There's yeah, tons. easily, yeah. Um, and they all have their. Some are better than others, but and different golden habitats. rods overall support 115 different species of insects. Wow. Um, insects are kind of that bond between a lot of plants and that next stage of the food chain. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the reasons they're so important. They support so many insects. Uh, birds love them. Um, they make good. Uh, well, hiding spots and, and habitat for a lot of different yeah. animal species. So they're really, really uh, important. If you're, I, that's one of the things I always recommend. If you're going to plant something and you're going to plant a forb, it's got to be a goldenrod first. That's yeah. probably my number one choice. Yeah. A lot of people plant milkweed first. The monarchs need gold, goldenrod too when they're migrating. So and they there's... need all kinds of forbs. It's uh, the caterpillars need milkweed, but yeah, the and... adults need nectar source and there's so many different species there's upland uh facultative wet mm-hmm. facultative uh seashore species some that bloom earlier uh, some that bloom later yeah it's... so it, it provides it's a very important one and, mm-hmm. and people people think of it and go oh my allergies yeah it, you yeah. know it's not which isn't necessarily the case yeah. that's and uh, what fran i'll back up what he was saying before that was you have seaside golden rod or solid yeah. semper virens for the, the seashore um some of the ones that we grow, we have uh, Canada goldenrod, which is yeah. really, really common. It's one of the uh, like old field species. So we talked a little bit about succession. I know some people consider that yeah. one a little more aggressive yeah. too. It can be in some areas. So with Forbes, a lot of the Forbes are early successional species as well. Yeah. There's stuff that if the best example I say, you had a farm field um, and then the farmer doesn't farm it for a couple of years. And somehow there weren't any invasives. A lot of invasives tend to be early successional species too. Well, you're going to see a lot of golden rods in the first, really the first year yeah. or two. You're going to, it's going to be almost all golden rods. Yeah. Um, and then a lot of mare's tail. And it'll slowly morph. And then, as we mentioned before, baptisia yeah. takes a long time. I think in some of these planned meadows, they've seen, they wouldn't even see baptisia until like year seven yeah sometimes is when they finally discover it in some of these planned meadows yeah you'll get um, but the know. golden rods are come up really easy come up quick and they're like canada golden run particularly yeah. aggressive but then you have some smaller less aggressive species like uh solid ego casea which is a uh, blue stem golden rod yeah um what are some of the other Nemoralis, ones? Nemoralis. Saldego Nemoralis, uh, which is a gray. gray goldenrod. Uh, Euthamia graminifolia, which is a flat, flat top. top goldenrod. There's a, a lot of diversity in the look as well. They all have that same, yeah. I shouldn't say all, but a lot of them have that similar yellow flower. Yeah. Some get but, really tall. Some some stay yeah. short. Some have basal foliage. It's, yeah. Some just get flowers right along them. When I was when I was looking for plant combinations during Carolyn's call, I was scrolling through my phone and I was like, oh yeah, there was that place we went to in Saratoga uh, Springs oh, yeah. State Park. And I, this was in September and um, I can't remember what one it was now, what the, the Latin name is for it, but it just had little yellow flowers all the way up the stem and no, it didn't have that same like cluster, goldenrod yeah. cluster that you think, but it was all along the stem. It was really, really cool. Uh, solid like a Ragosa, I think a stiff stem goldenrod, solid Ra- a wrinkle leaf, a wrinkle, gold, wrinkle leaf goldenrod, yeah. um, solid ego, uh, junkie or juncie. I'm, I'm forget the pronunciation, yeah. uh, is early goldenrod and that one blooms, We'll even see it end of July sometimes. Yeah. So it'll be July and August, and it's fading out as all these other golden rods are coming in. Yeah. So, th- so, yeah, that's a really important one. And one plant that you always see along with goldenrod are asters. Yeah. So both of these are really important, mainly because it's it's a mid to late summer into the fall. Mm-hmm. So and and you're you're extending that bloom period out. So it's really really yeah. important late late season species. And and why it's important to blend that or um, extend that bloom period is because this is like the last chance for a lot of pollinators and birds and all these other things to get that last bit of food 
yeah. for either the next leg of their journey or before the winter when they're they're starting to slow down their metabolism a little bit yeah. um, and they aren't going to have the opportunity to get anything until that next year either they're laying eggs there's all different kinds of things that they need that energy for and you have high energy food sources um, or high nutrition food sources to get them through that next step i do want to back up we yeah. mentioned allergies and then i cut you off oh yeah sorry go ahead one of the things with golden rods and i'm sure a lot of you, you already know this but a lot of people think they have golden rod allergies so when i say hey you should be planting golden rods there's well, i'm not going to do it because i'm allergic I don't, there's probably someone who's allergic yeah. to goldenrod actually, but most people are really allergic to ragweed. Um, and the defining feature with this is goldenrod is pollinator, pollinated, ragweed is wind pollinated. pollinated yeah. So the pollen that's in the air when you're seeing the goldenrod is the ragweed, ragweed pollen. Yeah. And that's what you're, you're really allergic to, but I'm allergic to everything, yeah. Yeah. actually, pretty <laughs> yeah. much. I have just about every allergy, <laughs> yeah. get, except for for peanuts. That's yeah. one that yeah. I know. Other nuts, yeah. You just don't like peanuts. I just don't like <laughs> The smell makes me nauseous. That's like fran repellent. Yeah. You just have to have, like, open peanut butter. So so don't be scared of the golden rods. You're not actually, you're probably not actually allergic to them. Yeah. But, but um, you know, the, the asters are another uh, uh, genus where you have multiple colors, you know, you have blues and purples mm -hmm. and whites, and yep. there's some that are fragrant and some that are, are swamp loving and some that are upland. There's such a large diversity of flower size and flower uh, color for asters. It's you can get a nice mix and 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 stagger those bloom times yeah. out a lot. Oh, so, yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we grow uh, New York aster and New England aster. But uh, there's a, a ton of other ones with um what's it smooth blue aster yeah is aster uh, leve yeah. or now there's symphiotrichum leve um what is the Eurybia divericata was the the one yeah. we mentioned earlier uh what's that oblonifolius uh yeah symphiotrichum uh, oblonifolium which is, is fragrant I think it's fragrant aster <laughs> we're both there you go. We're, Google hey I think let's talk about these plants are. that we think That's, we know what they one are of, one of the things we have issues with uh this is a little aside at the nursery is we deal we've talked about this before yeah. we deal almost exclusively in the botanical name yeah so sometimes we'll we'll say the common names to be hip with all the listeners yeah. and <laughs> talking their language so they know but, what we're talking yeah, about yeah sometimes we're like oh yeah I'm, is that actually the common name or is i'm not real hip not, no but, no i'm not real hip but there's there's a great diversity out there um and, and tons of native asters uh and one of the ones that i kept seeing in the fall people it was all over facebook people were saying hey who what is this plant it was heath aster yeah. which is i'm looking up the common name now but that was a, a whiter aster really small flowers yeah likes the edges of farm fields. I think one of the other common names was uh, like farm field aster or something yeah. like that. But so, you know, and, and other than we, we, we talked about goldenrods and asters, another uh, huge one is Joe pie. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, there's a, a lot of different sizes. Um, and especially with that, there's, there's a, and, and with the asters, there's a lot of cultivars with that, like mm -hmm. purple dome aster and uh, little Joe for someone that wants like a small Joe pie yep. weed. But the straight species, you're, you know, to me, Joe Pie can be some more of the majestic forbs. Oh, yeah. They're definitely yeah. taller, larger flowers. You get a lot of bang for the buck with uh, Lepidoptera and things like that. Yeah, so. I like to call them uh, like the, the helicopter landing pads for butterflies. <laughs> yeah. Because it just has that big flower head. And I, oh, I remember it was last, uh, probably August, I was mowing my lawn and pulled up to my native garden out in front of my house and there was six um well they were all swallowtails uh butterflies on two different uh stalks of a uh, joe pie weed i think there was four on one head and two on mm -hmm. the other but there was uh some tiger swallowtails and black swallowtails i forget the oh, number but is... i tried to i tried to get pictures of that and it didn't Man. just come out good but it was like this giant flower had all these butterflies on it it was really cool to see that so yeah they're, no, that's great. I mean, and you have purpurea, maculatum, fistulosum, mm -hmm. like there's white, there's pink, there's uh, larger flowers, larger leaves, mm -hmm. there, there's a, a ton of diversity. And most of them are like in that faculty, that middle of the road. Yeah, facultative. Yeah. Uh, so you get a lot of bang for the buck with that. You can definitely give them a little more space and, and they provide a, a good backdrop to some of the smaller forbs mm -hmm. that you can put in there. Um, yeah. What are some of the other ones you want to cover? 
I'm going to, because I don't, well, one of the ones that was, when I was doing the research yeah. for this, that came up was geraniums, which we only grow the wild geranium. The maculatum, yeah. Uh, geranium maculatum. And I didn't realize it was as good of a forb as it was, but I know it stays low to the ground, yeah. uh, like shade. That's, so yeah. if you're looking for something like shade, that, here's another plant combo for you, is uh, geranium maculatum and aquilegia candensis. Oh, that's nice. That's a cool combo too, because yeah, they both like shade. Uh, they are both stay pretty low to the ground. Yeah. The, the aquilegia which is red columbine has a stalk that comes up with a flower a little bell shaped flower on hangs top. over top so that's a cool combo yeah we tend to grow more sun loving uh yeah. perennials so mm -hmm. and that's 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 why it's we're yeah. limited on the shade loving perennials yeah. but and then uh i'm not as familiar with this plant but one that kind of fits that demographic i think is packer aria yeah which um I know a lot of people like that's with North Creek who when yeah. Steve was on, that's one of the things they grow quite a bit yeah. of. Um, but we'll skip to Asclepius. Which is uh, it? We, we've sung yeah. the praises of Asclepius, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, we, and, and again, you have upland and wetlands, mm -hmm. you have uh, a, a multitude of flower colors from orange to pink. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the big thing there is you're finding ones that are native to your area yeah. and, uh, Unless it's native to your area, don't get the tropical milkweed because yes. there's a lot of problems with the monarchs with that. Um, one of them being it's well, it's so commonly produced. It's, I shouldn't say, I'm trying to find the right way to say it, but uh, depending on the grower, it's not always neonicotinoid free. Yeah. So with four, if you're raising caterpillars uh, and it's not neonic, neonic free with the caterpillars, you're going to be eating that plant. And, yeah. Uh, that's a death sentence for them in some cases yes. so you want to watch out for that and then a lot it, because it keeps that long blue bloom time um it'll keep the monarchs around a little bit too long sometimes when it gets too cold for them as well so that's yeah. why i've seen all over they say don't they don't recommend planting that one unless yeah. and that's a uh, asclepius curasava i think so it, yeah i'm probably screwing yeah. up the name the the botanical name there but 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 you can use tuberosa which stays yeah. lower which is the, the butterfly weed one. the orange one uh syriaca which is common which gets taller mm -hmm. swamp milkweed um asclepias incarnata is another great yeah. one and uh, you have all the ones out west purpureum purpureums which is native here as well um uh out west you have like poke milkweed and antelope antelope horns and there's all kinds of and i'm just not familiar. um yeah I'm, I'm not as familiar with them as well even though we sourced a lot of them it's we've kind of stuck to a handful of species that uh we could find all over this was the with the monarchs and the rough thing is the price of milkweed seed in particular could be uh very very broad and it seemed oh, like yeah. syriaca was tended to be pretty inexpensive tuberosa sometimes was inexpensive um and we were dealing with a program that had a budget so we couldn't get into some of the really cool ones like antelope horns and yeah poke milkweed and and those but yeah. and, um, and they're not as as common so it's yeah you know it's but it's just just as interesting yep so yeah. um and that's like uh you'll see a graphic on our website that i think it went up a couple days ago um that you can actually eat milkweed uh, contrary to, to what you might have heard that it's poisonous well it is poisonous but if you if you treat it right you blanch it and or you boil it and get some of those toxins out it is edible yeah and yeah. Uh, the spring shoots are similar to asparagus yeah. you can eat the pods when they're they're new yeah so yeah. those those are great i i love minarda species um yeah. between minarda yeah. and and just joe pie you, you know you have the diversity in joe pie like uh um blue mist flower mm -hmm. you know to to yeah we purple forgot pie, yeah, yeah eupatorium perfoliatum but you know minarda you have didyma and fistulosa uh which is wild bergamot mm -hmm. and and uh bee balm you know there's there's spotted bee balm which is minarda punctata that which is great cool. for yeah. you know it's a very different look and pollinators love that when they flock to that one so mm -hmm. um and you, then you have your also in that mint family is your picnanthemums yeah. um which we grow the tenia folium and yes. the virginianum mm -hmm. uh virginia mountain lint mint and slender mountain mint yeah. uh virginia is virginianum slender is tenia folium yeah. um but those are some pollinator magnets man yeah. they yeah. love the the picnanthemum totally so but totally. um the other thing we found with those species uh which i've heard contrasting information but we found they tend to be a little more deer resistant because yeah. they're just a the little fragrance. more fragrant. Yeah. But then I've heard other people say that they mow down their field of fistulosa and 
they stay away from the things that we have your problems on no, here. And, so I think it's preference for where you are you, too. You know, and I've seen, I know there's books about deer resistant native plants and things like that, but in almost every instance I've seen deer eat just about every native plant, mm -hmm. even things that I've American holly, things like that. It depends yeah. on the severity and, and what's available food source available. So it's, you know, that's what they've co-evolved with. They've learned to eat these things. They know in a pinch, if nothing else is available, they can get away with eating this, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, I, I don't recommend anything personally based on deer resistance, yeah. but yeah. that's one that, yeah, de depending on what else is available with mm -hmm. the fragrance that, you know, in the mint family, they tend to stay away with the, you know, unless they have to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if I were starving, I'd, I'd start getting real creative yeah. on, 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 yeah, oh yeah. on a, you know, I, I'd even eat peanut butter yeah. if I were starving. So, so uh, some of the other stuff was um, a lot of the cone flowers yeah. are really good for, for starting your garden. One, because they're highly recognizable. You look at, uh, well, black eyed Susans or your, your Becky species and then your echinacea species, people know them. Yeah. So it's, that's that we've said it before that gateway into native gardening is well i've gone to the garden center and seen purple coneflower before yeah. i've seen black eyed susan before i didn't know they were native so no. natives must be good yeah um it's you, a good introduction to get into it and they they attract things like goldfinch that love yep. eating on the seed heads and things like that so it's you know you're starting to attract some different birds with, with some of these species yeah. uh edge habitat birds that mm -hmm. type of thing so it's um there cone flowers are some great ones yeah. so i'd say like a well, purple cone flower which is echinacea purpurea you have echinacea pallida which pallida. is is it pale purple cone I flower think I, so i yeah. forget the common name again um and then the rubecchia's uh rubecchia triloba i mentioned earlier um rubecchia herta rubecchia fulgida yeah. uh, rubecchia lanceolata is another yeah, one which is cut leaf cone so, flower yeah yeah there's which some is, gets taller really and cool likes wet it's a facultative wet um you know, uh, some of our favorites, uh, lobelia, yeah. both the cardinal flower, the cardinalis, and the blue, great blue lobelia, mm -hmm. uh, syphilitica. You know, if you want hummingbirds, that's exactly. a great, uh, that's a hummingbird magnet. And it's, you know, it's, there's not too many pure red flowers when it comes to wetland plants. Yeah. So, yep. uh, especially in the Northeast. So that's a great choice, you know, that and Minarda didima, which I think is a facultative. I think it's facultative or. I don't remember. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's it likes it a little bit drier. Yeah. You know, but they have you know again, Lobelia has basal foliage uh, with the flower stalks, and you get blue or red. So mm -hmm. you have you have some really cool combination. Plus, they cross in the wild as well. You get some some pretty unique yeah, flower a... sizes and 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 color combinations. Mm -hmm. We we have that here in our own seed fields yeah. where we get the cross pollination. A uh, couple other ones to wrap up was um, wild strawberry. Yeah, the, that's the, a great one and another edible. Yeah. Um, some of your ironweeds, New York ironweed in particular, what's that? Renonia and Nova Boris census. Mm -hmm. Um, we mentioned that one earlier. That's gets a little taller. That one's pretty cool. Um, and then, uh, some of your native thistles are mm -hmm. not, maybe not, not the ideal garden plant, but when it comes to meadows and wild spaces, they provide a lot of value for pollinators. Yeah. And people think of thistle and they think of a nuisance plant, mm -hmm. you know, and it's there, there's actually a lot of value into those native thistles. You know, there's a lot of great, like all the, all the sunflowers, uh, you know, that's something you start touching on all that. There's, oh, there's yeah. so many, as far as sizes and yeah. Oh, do we even talk? About no, we we, we 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 glossed right over that. We yeah. even talk about. Yeah, some of the sunflowers are uh, are awesome. Like the one of my favorites. Now I'm thinking about it is uh is Helianthus angustifolius, um, which is swamp sunflower. But then you have uh another Helianthus maximilii is maximilian sunflower, um. Heliopsis helianthoides is, is false sunflower, oxide yeah. sunflower. Uh, all tend to get pretty tall. Of those three, you get to get pretty tall and um, but just have such a cool flower head. And they're the swamp sunflower in particular is like yeah. almost imposing when, when you go up oh, to a field of it. Yeah. It's, uh, because it's tall, it's yellow, it's flopping over at you. It's, it's actually imposing to like glows. walk through it, <laughs> it you glows. know, and it, yeah, yeah, yeah it, it, it totally does. So I, I thought it. You know, it, it would be a good idea for both of us to to mention what our favorite forests are, mm -hmm. but it's no surprise because we've actually we've said, said this. Both we've said it before. before. So, um, and mine obviously is Iris Versicolor. I just think that's such a versatile and and there's a beauty and elegance in its in in its simplicity. Mm -hmm. 
and and that one's always been a favorite for me and it's just an early bloomer and it's and i like to even even though it's early it's something that hummingbirds yeah. like so it's yep. um fighter remediation uh it can be used for there's so many so many it, it's so versatile even though it's an obligate it's it can take it could take dry conditions it's great in a rain garden yeah. so it's i i just love the beauty of that yeah one. and way back when and it was our first or second episode when we were asked this question episode, what was yeah. our favorite native plant yeah. i said uh liatris piccata and i'm gonna stick with that all right awesome. um, although there's a ton of different liatrises especially when you got into the midwest oh, yeah. missouri kansas nebraska yeah. uh liatris squarosa uh, liatris graminifolia i think yeah. it's common in the southeast um there's some really cool ones where uh, Leatris spicata has that long, slender, uh, same same basal foliage, but then has a long, slender shoot that comes up that gets covered yeah. in little tiny, fuzzy, purple, um, like almost like dusters, feather dusters. <laughs> it almost looks like you know. But, it's, uh, so many of of these things that we're mentioning too make great cut flowers. Like yeah. Leatris spicata is a great yeah. uh, great to cut with a vase, like with Ver mm -hmm. Verona castrum and. Uh, you know, purple cone flower. Yeah, a lot of these yeah. make great cut. You know, if you have them in your garden, you get to enjoy them as well. Besides providing yeah, great we habitat, we even talk about a uh, Veronicastrum virginicum, which is oh crap, I'm white snake culver's root. Culver's root. Culver's root. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, but why I like the Leatris piccata too is like that long, slender flower stalk. Yeah, it gives you a different um, angle for for pictures of butterflies. The yeah. butterflies love it. And they'll land on it. And now instead of being, uh, I guess, horizontal, they're vertical, vertical with the wings hanging off the back. And you can really frame that stalk mm -hmm. in a way where you get the stalk kind of like filling up a quarter of the frame on one side and then the butterflies centered and oh, it looks yeah. really cool. And then plus, you can blur the background. It's plus that thread like foliage. Shiny. It's it's a it's a unique looking plant. Oh, yeah. It's it's definitely yeah. um, and it's not something that flops over or yeah. You know, it's it's got a pretty stiff stalk yeah. to it. Any so. other things that you, we we might have missed that you're thinking of that we uh, should mention? I'm sure we missed a ton. The only one I came up was Eurinchium yuccifolium, which isn't oh, which necessarily is... nate. It's extirpated in New Jersey. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's if you want that like desert Southwest look. Yeah. That's, that's a cool. That's one. a great so. look. Yeah. No, I yeah. think that's you know obviously there's we could go on for we could go on this forever. has already turned into a ramble <laughs> yeah it, it has <laughs> it has but that that gives you some great ideas plus yeah. between our callers uh they gave you some great color combinations mm -hmm. um as i said make sure you're matching up when you're you're making these selections you're you're matching up remember a lot of these plants there's a lot of versatility as far as oh, yeah. wetland indicator status sun and shade highlights flower mm -hmm. color heights um you can really you know basal foliage you can you can easily make a wonderful looking uh habitat in your yard that mm -hmm. that everyone can enjoy and be a part of so um i think that wraps it up not for the whole show no 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 segment. you I, still have the complaint you know you and, haven't and, complained uh, once well i guess and, you kind of complained about the noise yeah <laughs> you, you know I, and i'm all right i'm, I'm gonna play my my theme music first <laughs> So I, I'm hesitant to make this reoccurring every week because I don't want to complain. I think even though I complain a lot, <laughs> I would say I'm relatively a positive person, even though it's You're the most positive person that complains, complains. on an hourly basis, <laughs> <laughs> which is true, which yeah, is true. Yeah. I, I think I have a positive outlook, but I do have a tendency to complain. So I don't want it to go into rants or complaints. But one thing that I thought of, I actually hadn't worked this into the buzz, but you had recently posted, I think it was in our Facebook group, um, something about invasives, and they were talking mm -hmm. about Bradford pear. Now, and they did specify calorie pear, also known as Bradford pear. So, this has always been a huge uh, gripe for me: is that Bradford pear is a cultivar of calorie pear. So, Pyrus caloriana is the invasive. So, but it. Bradford is the most recognizable name mm -hmm. that people just tend to call it. They see it and say Bradford pear. But where I get concerned is that there's multiple cultivars mm -hmm. of calorie pear. There's Cleveland Select and Chanticleer, which I, I think they found out they were actually the same plant. Yeah. Um, aristocrat, because it's different head head types. There's, But there's a lot of different cultivars. And when people think Bradford pear is the bad one, they can go out and say, oh, well, this is an aristocrat pear. This one's mm -hmm. not invasive. Yeah. No, it's they're all calorie pears. 
and they're all invasive. You know, they're not mm -hmm. sterile. They all provide seed that gets dispersed. Uh, birds easily carry that. Yep. And and yep. we we've talked about on numerous occasions and in, in videos and on the podcast just how bad that plant is. So just remember Bradford is just one cultivar mm -hmm. of calorie pear. Be aware of all calorie pears. So Pyrus yep. caloriana, Bradford aristocrat, any of them, they're they all have that significance as mm. as far as being bad yeah that, and that's good advice because i i use the terms almost interchangeably yeah um and obviously i know the difference yeah. but if i'm using a presentation well the yeah. people i'm talking to might not know the difference so yeah and that's it's important to to make sure you distinguish that they are well it's a like that a square is a rectangle, but not every rectangle is a square thing. Yeah. But um, yeah. that you identify that they are separate things, but uh, but they're both. Oh, totally. They, yeah. yeah. You, you know, now the difference in cultivars are, are head shape and mm -hmm. calorie pairs are weak wooded. So, you know, back in the day before everyone knew they were invasive, you would pick one over another because it, you know, Bradford would tend to have bad pruning techniques. People would top it, it would just suck her up, and then they would all split and break, mm -hmm. and they get fire blight. That they have so many disease issues as it is already. They were already a problem before they realized how invasive they were. So mm -hmm. it's just, it's just a plant that if you could stay away from it, there's so many great alternatives to that plant. Yeah. Just, yeah. just, just stay away. So that's my, that's my rant. So, I, but I think one. that was an on-topic rant. And you kept it short and to the point. There you go. Right. So, time-wise, we're actually like about an hour and 22 minutes so we'll do a, a quick pod deck yeah, and yep. then we'll wrap it up all mm -hmm. right so i have my i have so many screens open on my computer <laughs> i can't even see the zoom the zoom so what are the odds i pick interview your significant <laughs> yeah. other again we're gonna have to do that one soon too. yeah we are okay so i'm going to pick one randomly talk about your favorite famous dead person. That's going to be a problem for me because I don't, <laughs> I don't know who's dead or alive in a lot of cases. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, all right. You want me to go first? I could have sworn. Well, this is back in like the holiday movies, all the crappy like lifetime holiday movies. My wife and I were watching one and I could have sworn it was Wil Wilford Brimley that was in it. And I was like, yeah, he like just died too. And I was, I think I was right on part of it, but it wasn't Wilford Brimley. It was another guy. <laughs> All right. Well, I actually have one and it, it, it ties into something I talked about earlier about John Hughes. Mm -hmm. So uh, John Hughes passed away uh, at an early age. And um, so as a, as a teenager growing up in the eighties, I was a huge fan of John Hughes because he was mm -hmm. responsible for so many movies that spoke to teens at that, the time frame. So uh, the breakfast club, pretty in pink, 16 candles, mm -hmm. weird science. And then you add on vacation, Christmas vacation, home alone, like all these great, some kind of wonderful, um, all these great movies that he was associated with in part, whether he wrote or directed. So I could quote so many of his movies as mm -hmm. a teen, that, like he spoke to our generation or my generation as at that time. So uh, when I was working at Princeton nurseries, I inherited his account. Um, he uh, living in Illinois, where most of his uh, movies take place, Shermer, Illinois, which doesn't exist, but he lived in Harvard, Illinois. And um, my boss at the time, he called in there, and it was at a time where nursery stock wasn't moving really well. And he called at the end of the day when he was trying to leave mm -hmm. and started ordering trailer loads of trees. And my boss thought it was a prank. He thought someone was actually pranking him because no one was ordering trees, <laughs> yeah. like large caliper trees at that that time frame. So he he was like, who is this again? And he was like, oh, this is John Hughes. You know, I got the idea to start an arboretum on my property from my good friend, John Candy. Then it mm. clicked for him. So, and you know, this was Zach, uh, yeah. our friend yeah. Zach. So, um, and as soon as he realized who it was, John Hughes was like, I got to go. So, you know, but he became a reoccurring customer and he just wanted to talk plants. So when, when Zach uh, left and went to another nursery, I acquired the account and John would always call at the end of the day. And he would just want to talk plants and he would want to talk plants for hours. Like the phone calls mm -hmm. would be an hour to two hours. 
you know, and I love the fact that I was getting to talk with one of my heroes, but you couldn't talk industry with him or the, yeah. the phone call ended. Like you had to be professional. He wanted to talk plants. He was very knowledgeable, but he didn't want to talk about being a writer, director, or anything like that. So you yeah. kind of had to steer away from that. So okay. I, I'm making this a long story. So <laughs> the, I finally got up enough courage. The name of his his arboretum was Red Wing Farm, mm -hmm. and I I'm a huge even though growing up in the Philadelphia area and I love the Eagles, Phillies, and Sixers. I'm a Red Wings fan and have been since like 1983. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask him how he got the name for for Red Wing Farm. And I finally said, uh, how, you know, what did you name Red Wing Farm after? And he was like, why do you ask? Like, and it stopped, like the tone changed. And I was like, oh, well, I'm a Red Wings fan. I have been since Steve Eisman's rookie year. And he goes, oh, I named it after the Red Wing Blackbird. But, mm -hmm. you know, I forgot in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Cameron wears a Gordie Howe Red Wings jersey. So I'm like, he's probably oh, thinking, yeah, yeah. oh. <laughs> so, and he, he goes, oh, you know, I have a funny story for you. I, you know, I grew up in Detroit. But I live in Chicago and I raise my kids here. So I become a Blackhawks fan and, and me and my kids have have season tickets. So we're going to a game uh, against the Blackhawks versus the Red Wings. And I'm driving in and we're in my truck. And as I'm pulling through the parking lot, everyone's giving me the finger and yelling at me. And he goes, and it's not just one or two people. It's like consistent. Like people are like yelling. And he's like, wow, was my last movie that bad? Like they all hate <laughs> yeah. me that bad. And he goes, so we park and I get out of the truck and I realize I'm in my Red Wing farm truck and they're playing the Red Wings oh, at yeah. night and everyone's just, <laughs> yeah. so after that, we started talking about move. We would email each other. We would talk about, um, you know, if the Red Wings were playing the Blackhawks or something like that, he would just send, shoot me an email, you know, in reference to, to hockey all mm -hmm. the time. But, you know, and, and I got invited out. Fred, I'm sorry to, yeah. <laughs> I was just looking up and there's smoke coming out of the ceiling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah. I think we're safe. I think I hear a drill or a saw. So, but he did invite me out to his property. I was his sales rep because I, I covered the Midwest. And uh, the one time I was going out there, I offered to drop off the new catalog. And he goes, oh, I'm actually going to be in New York filming a movie. So I won't be able to catch up. And he passed away shortly after. Oh, wow. You can really smell that now yeah. too. Yeah. Wow. So, hey, we're yeah. almost done. We're almost done. So, <laughs> so, but that's my, that's my John Hughes my john Hughes, my favorite when, dead you, person. when you sit and referenced him earlier that this was going to be the episode i had no idea you were pushing it off no i had no idea that's that's perfect i i told it now yeah this is uh i don't want anyone to think this is a cop out but i didn't want to keep it somewhat podcast or plant relative yeah. relevant again and I, i'm going to say Ada leopold uh, that's an um, awesome one and only reason i would say people might think it's a cop out is because he's so uh, inspirational in so many people's lives and it's someone that i'd want to sit down with he's i would love to have a chat fathers of conservation oh so we i i don't know if if we would have this business or we'd be doing what we're doing yeah. without him oh yeah and that actually kind of ties into our next podcast mm -hmm. which will be the government's uh, the next rooted discussion yeah. it's been a while but um the government's role in restoration and i think that should be interesting. We we did find out we're not sure at this point if Emil DeVito is going to be able to make it, but we still have a good uh, lineup mm -hmm. regardless, and and some yeah, good. Everyone topics. else is in for we have a, a day and there, a time. There may just Emil be a conflict. Just, it might have a conflict, so we're hoping he can make it. But yeah, I agree, it's, it'll be good regardless uh, if he's there or not. Yeah. Although I was after our last episode with Emil, um, and those of you who know Emil, he is very um, demonstrative and and you can get him fired up pretty yeah. easily and he was so reserved it was a different side of a meal i was used to seeing yeah um, oh. still very good but uh there weren't any fireworks he was behaving so he, he was very well behaved <laughs> he was behaving. and this was we were really yeah. going to try and lure him out of his shell with, uh, with, uh, with this totally. uh, government and restoration totally. episode but although leopold i actually that was my first thought yeah. when i saw that yeah. but i thought john hughes was actually kind of industry related mm -hmm. and it was kind of cool to get to talk get to talk shop as far as yeah. plants go with one of my childhood heroes mm -hmm. that he was a hero for a different reason, but we had a common interest that we got to talk about for hours. You know, I can probably accumulate over my career, like, like 20 hours worth of con yeah. tree conversations with John Hughes, yep. which was definitely a highlight for me. I would, I would get all giddy. It was like, I'd see, <laughs> cause <he's calling. laughs> cause who I talked to so awesome, you know, but, uh, 
you know, even our drivers, when they would go out to see him, he would give tours mm -hmm. on a golf cart yeah. for anyone that came. He was so proud of the Arboretum he had built. Wow. It was like a huge accomplishment for him. Yeah, so that's very it was, cool. It was very, not, not something very many people know about him yeah. about. So cool. So that is it. Thank you again for joining us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed listening to the buzz. Thank you everyone again for tuning in to native plants healthy planet presented by pylons nursery uh we're as always we're giving a huge thank you to rj comer uh for our buzz theme music and we're going to premiere uh his music with um uh rooted discussions uh so that will have its own music are you are you looking at the smoking no uh, i was I, <laughs> the sound it sounds like <laughs> I, I can hear it I probably know what else can hear. Together, so <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what I'm hearing. So uh, make sure you stream or buy RJ's music on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you consume your music. Follow us on Twitter at Pineland Nursery. More of you have been following us there. We really appreciate mm -hmm. that. We'll get better at putting up more content there. Um, you can follow us at Facebook at Pinelands Nursery NJ, Instagram at Pinelands Nursery, and YouTube. We we hit our goal. Yes, we're, we did. We're well over the goal. Yeah. We're just waiting to be able to turn on that custom custom uh, URL. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, but right now, if you just search Pinelands Nursery, uh, you'll you'll get our YouTube page. If you have a question or comment. Uh, you can call us at the question and comment line, just like Saul and Carolyn did. Even mm -hmm. Kelly, Kelly Gill did today. Uh, call us at 215-346-6189. Again, that's 215-346-6189. Ask a question, leave a comment. If we pick your question or comment, we'll play it on a future episode of The Buzz, just like we did today. And and we'll answer or we'll phone a friend. We'll yeah. have a friend answer. Oh, yeah. You never know who's going to call in or who's going to answer. <laughs> we're, we're, we're making it a huge mystery from this point forward. Um, and I know we talked about it before, but the Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group, a great, you know, a lot of people asking great questions. I think there's going to be a Native Plants Healthy Planet uh, book, book group, club. Yeah. book club now, yeah. which I'm excited about. And maybe they'll read braiding sweetgrass with robin wall you, you know what maybe after this episode i'll go on I and say you can, <laughs> yeah that's i'm but, just behind the yeah. i'm behind but that's great i'm just such a slow reader i'm i'm hesitant to commit mm -hmm. because of how slow i read so but uh definitely uh if you haven't joined please join uh you'll find the conversation great there yeah yeah we want to keep that conversation going and um as always, you can listen to the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast directly at www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. You can also check us out at Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, really wherever you consume your podcast. Yeah. Uh, make sure when you're there, subscribe, leave a review, and share this with a friend. We want to keep this message, spread this message. Um, if you didn't share last week, share this week, because this is a good week to to really get people, give them a, a baseline to start with some Forbes. And That's the big big jump is, yeah. well, I don't know what to plant. And you could find all kinds of resources out there. Are, but are we committing to the next buzz? Are we doing graminoids? Yeah, we're going to do graminoids next. All right. So the next mm -hmm. one will be the next in our series will be graminoids. So it's a great one to to share this one with someone because they have something to look forward to with exactly. the next one. They'll all yep. kind of tie in together. Plus, Saul called this one, so it's a great to introduce yeah everyone oh, yeah. to Saul. But we really need to thank all of you for making the circle bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's been amazing. The amount we we got like three or four more five-star reviews yeah. um and we're at a point where each episode is bigger than the last and yeah. like we're we keep wondering well how how many listens can we get and we keep exceeding what we think so we're it's uh we're humbled by it and yeah. but at the same time like i was saying in the beginning it's important we get this message out there um and it we're just starting conversation so yeah and it's it's nice to see that it's a conversation that people want to yeah. hear or be a part yeah. of and as always if you if you can't get your friend to go listen next time you're over their house which you shouldn't be it's covid times you yes. shouldn't be visiting anyone. yeah let's say you're over over a family member's <laughs> house and they don't they don't want to listen to just say hey alexa play the native plants healthy planet podcast and uh and that'll get us a listen yeah, if you're regard. on zoom and you can see in a like an alexa <laughs> enabled device behind we just say it on zoom yeah, yeah you know see if it works so with that thank you everyone i'm tom and i am fran thank you again everyone we will see you on the next episode which will be a uh, rooted discussion we're excited about until then keep it native Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.